Hello, welcome to our worship service for the third Sunday of the Easter season. Today we'll be following the order of service of Divine Service Setting 1, found on page 151 in the Lutheran Service Book. We begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We now read responsively our psalm for the day, which is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 14, using verse 5 as the antiphon at the beginning and end. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. We continue by praying together the Kyrie, found on page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing, This is the Feast. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. 
power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And the Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the third Sunday in the Easter season comes from Acts chapter 2. Peter standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 1. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. 
While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They are at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet had spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. And has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And for the hymn of the day, we are going to sing. Hymn 476, which is, Who Are You Who Walk in Sorrow? Who are you who walk in sorrow down Emmaus barren road? Hearts distraught and hope defeated, bent beneath grief's crushing load. Nameless mourners, we will join you, we who also mourn our dead. We have stood by graves unyielding, eaten death's bare bitter bread. Who is this who joins our journey, walking with us stride by stride? Unknown stranger, can you fathom depths of grief for one who died? Then the wonder when we told you How our dreams to dust have turned Then you opened wide the scriptures Till our hearts within us burned Who are you? Our hearts are opened In the breaking of the bread Christ the victim, now the victor, living, risen from the dead. Great companion on our journey, still surprise us with your grace. Make each day a new Emmaus, on our hearts your image trace. Who are we who travel with you on our way through life to death? Women, men, the young, the aging, waken by the Spirit's breath. At the font you claim and name us, 
born of water and the word at the table still you feed us host us as a risen lord alleluia alleluia is the easter hymn we sing take our life our joy our worship as the gift of love we bring you have formed us all one people called from every land and race make the church your servant body sent to share your healing grace In the name of Jesus, amen. In this pandemic, I've actually had the opportunity, uh, like many of us, to read a whole lot more than what I have been reading in the last few months. One of the first books that I tackled was this one. It's entitled The Revenge of Analog by David Sachs. Now, this book is about the resurrection of certain analog uh, technologies like vinyl records and board games. The author, uh, David Sachs, basically details and says the reason for this uh, resurgence is because the, the very digital life that we have now simply isn't as great and as wonderful as the advertisers told us that it was going to be. Now, I, I really enjoyed this book, but I have to say, if you pick it up, uh, be forewarned that the author uses and is not afraid of using some crass language. But for today's message, I want to talk about the section where he describes board games. And he compares board games to video games, but not just all video games, specifically the type where you play multiplayer online. And he had some, some words that I thought uh, were excellent. I wanted to share them with you. He says, as technology improved, video gaming became a solitary experience. Even if you are playing World of Warcraft or Call of Duty with the same group of friends around the world each day, talking smack over your headsets and typing in snippets of conversation, you are ultimately alone in a room with a screen and the loneliness washed over you like a wave when the game ended. By the time the iPad came around and truly mobile gaming had blossomed, the last crumbs of real social interaction disappeared from video games. Now, these words have been rolling around in my brain over the last couple weeks because in more than just the way in which we game and play with each other, really our entire way of interacting with one another socially has gone digital. We go to school on Facebook. We hang out with our friends on Zoom. We go to worship on YouTube. And I'm becoming more and more convinced as this pandemic continues that these things, and they are just a pale comparison and anemic and sickly substitute for the real deal, for real human interaction. It's simply not good for us to do all and or even most of our social interacting online. It's just not good. And the proof is, is in the pudding. I would imagine that most of you have felt that same wave of loneliness, loneliness that David Sachs was talking about after you finished a Zoom meeting or following a worship service on your phone. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been speaking with uh, various indifferent people, uh, just on the phone, catching up with them, trying to see how they're holding up through this whole mess. Kind of the common refrain that I'm getting is that everyone is exhausted. And surprisingly so, because they, they always say, well, I, I'm not doing that much, but I just I feel so worn out. And the reason for that is because of it's all digital and it's unfulfilling and it's just not meeting that need we have. And so we're feeling worn out and extra stressed. Now, Captain Obvious here. When you're worn out and stressed, you're not on your A game. 
When you're worn out and stressed, those two things are a fertile field for the poisonous plant of sin. So stressed out, so exhausted, we end up reacting in anger to our loved ones and our friends. We try to cope with this difficulty and this stress in some of the worst possible ways, by binge eating, uh, by binge drinking. We try to just escape from it into nonstop Netflix marathons or, you know, video games. And I think what the worst of all, though, is that this slowdown has shown a spotlight on a lot of the flaws in our relationships that we can usually safely ignore when we're going 100 miles an hour, and it's, it's really frightening. The rotten cherry on top, though, is when I think about the fact that this could happen next year. It about makes me sick to my stomach, and I just hang my head in sadness. On the road to Emmaus, we meet two other men who likewise hung their head in sadness. They were sad, though, not over a global pandemic, but over the events of Holy Week. I mean, just imagine the ups and the downs, the high and lows these two disciples of Jesus would have experienced that week. Their joy would have just been bursting at, at the limits as they join their voices with the crowd, welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, singing, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Their pride and just courage would have gone right up and skyrocketed as Jesus took on every single newcomer who was challenging his teaching. And through it all, their hope would have ballooned as they knew it was coming true that Jesus was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel, was going to be the one who was going to bring God's kingdom on earth. But then they woke up Friday morning to a gut punch with the message that the chief priests on Thursday night had arrested Jesus and that moment were taking him out of the city to crucify him. And standing at a safe distance, they saw Jesus draw his last breath. And with that, there ballooned up hope ruptured like an aneurysm, causing the greatest of sins. Death, a faith in God's promises, in God's word, and in God's Christ. And so as they trudged home, they were surely filled with sadness and exhaustion. But on that sorrow-filled, exhaustion-filled journey from Jerusalem, something simply amazing takes place. Jesus drew near and went with them. Now, they didn't know that it was the risen Lord Christ, because their eyes were kept from recognizing it. But what we get to see in this story is how Jesus treats and cares for and loves his exhausted and his worn out, stressed out, saddened disciples. Right? At first, he approaches them and he says to them, what's this that you guys are talking about? Now, he already knows, right? Because he went through all those things. He knows the events. He knows their heartaches and their troubles. But he gives them opportunity to let off the steam of their pain and their hurt by telling their story, even to the point of admitting their sin, of denying the resurrection. Go figure. Jesus knows that confession is very good for the soul. And then when they confess their sin, we should rejoice in how he responds to their sin. Right? It tells us in the scripture there, in Luke 24, verses 25 and 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones, 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now, you see, he calls their sin for what it is. He calls them foolish and slow to heart. But what's amazing is that he does not neglect them and he does not reject them or punish them for it. And here we see that godly middle road between completely ignoring sin on one side and being a merciless punisher of sin on the other side. Here, in the middle, we see Jesus. We see grace, mercy, and forgiveness. For despite their sin, he does not abandon them. He sticks with them. But even greater grace, he leads them out of their sin. With a gentle hand, he sets them straight. He makes it right. We hear what he did in verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And we get to hear what the end results of that teaching was. Right? At the end of the story, those disciples recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread. And when that happens, he disappears from their eyes. And as they're talking about it afterwards, they're reflecting on that travel with Jesus and what it felt like. And they said, Did, didn't, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? You see, life, the events of Holy Week, had smothered out the flame in their hearts of love and faith and joy. But with his care and with his presence, Jesus had rekindled it back to life. Truly here we see the fulfillment and the truth of Jesus' own words in Matthew 11. Where he says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In our exhaustion, we wish that Jesus would do the same. That he would come alongside of us as we travel. And here's the good news. That's exactly what he does for us. You see, there's two disciples in the story. One named Cleopas, and the other is anonymous. With this, the Holy Spirit invites us to see ourselves as that disciple. To see ourselves on that road to Damascus, and to understand that the whole life of discipleship, the journey of discipleship that you and I are on, is nothing other than the walk to Emmaus. Because just like those two disciples on the very first Easter, Jesus comes to us and he travels beside us, but hidden from sight in ways that only faith can perceive. Perhaps he shows up in the form of a stranger or in the form of a pastor or a brother and sister in Christ. Jesus comes to us by his spirit in the word and in the sacraments. And he does the same things for us that he did for those two disciples. The first thing that he does is that he gives us the opportunity to lay out our hearts, our pain, and our sorrow upon the table. And we do that as we take everything to God in prayer. Or as we share our, our hurts and our worries, and our fears, and our failures with our pastors in confession, or with a trusted fellow believer in Christ. He knows that it's good for us to get those things out, especially the sins right now during this 
terrible time, this strange, difficult time. And yeah, just like those disciples on the road, he calls us our sin out. He does it through the law in his word. He does it through our consciences. And he does it in the truly good Christian friends that we have who love us enough to actually tell us the truth about our sin. But the good news is, is that even though he calls our sin out, he doesn't punish us and he doesn't reject us. He sticks with you. Your sin cannot drive Jesus away. And we know that because of the cross. Jesus endured all of this pain, all of this suffering to secure your everlasting salvation to give you everlasting life in paradise. And if he went through that, then your sins can't keep him away. His incredibly deep love, his patience with you will outlast your impatience, your pettiness, your failures. So yeah, he does put up with us. He does show great patience for us as we continue to sin. But his mercy goes even further because he is not simply content in leaving us in our sin. He wants to lead us out with a, a true and kind hand, just as he did for those disciples. You know, I really wish that I could have heard what they had talked about on that road to Emmaus. But you know, in the end, we're not actually out of the loop. Because what he taught them is simply the very New Testament. It's what he taught his disciples. It's what they witnessed with their eyes, what they saw him do and say. And so, make use of it. When you're finding it hard to love your family right now, when you're catching yourself coping in really destructive ways, when you're terribly fearful of the future about what might happen, go to your Savior and spend time with Him. Confess to Him. Ask Him for guidance in His Holy Spirit and then sit at His feet and learn have him open the scriptures to you. Read the gospel. And right now at the slowdown, this is a fantastic time to get reacquainted with your Savior. Read one chapter of a, of a gospel a day and then read through the whole thing. Listen to it on an app when you're doing the dishes or cleaning your house. Talk about it. Read it with your families at mealtimes. And if you do this, then God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will, will work through that in order to do for you what he did, what Jesus had done for them. He will rekindle the flame in your cold hearts and you will find that each step will not be as difficult to take. And the journey will get easier. And like that story of the road to Emmaus, we know that our journey will have an end. One day we will reach our everlasting home when we join in the resurrection on the last day. And on that day, we will recline with Jesus at his feast. And on that day, we will recognize him. Faith will become sight, and we will be able to see that Jesus went with us the whole way. But there is an incredibly important difference between the story of the road to Emmaus and our own life and journey as disciples. Right At the end of the story of Emmaus, Jesus disappeared. 
but in our faith walk in life. At the very end, when Jesus, when we see Jesus, when we recognize him, he will be with us forever. And we will, as everlasting ages run, behold his glorious face. In the meantime, though, as things get tough, as things get hard, as you are worn out and stressed to the max and saddened by all this, may your prayer be the words of that beautiful hymn. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. And know that he has answered that prayer. And he has your hand right now. Amen. We now confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 159 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, receive our thanks for your great goodness to us. Receive our thanks for continuing to provide for us in this pandemic, for keeping us safe and healthy, and allowing for the technologies that allow your word to be proclaimed to all people. Bless that word. Bless those who hear it, that it may grow up and bear abundant fruit so that they can live as lights of the world and be the salt of the earth as your Son has called them to. Keep all of us strong in our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and his victory over death and the grave that he has won for us. Hear our prayer on behalf of all those in authority. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Guide all leaders of our country and of the world that a spirit of concord and peace might work mightily through all, that we might come together for the common welfare of all humanity towards the end of this pandemic and other crises. Continue to extend your blessing upon all those who are working in the medical field and all those who are sick. Give them healing and strength Keep them healthy and whole to continue to put one foot after another under this difficult situation and difficult journey. Lord, we ask your blessing upon our nation, its economy, our agriculture, and all of our industries. Allow for the fruitful weather, or the seasonal weather, that would allow for the fruitfulness of the earth. Lord, these things and whatever else you know that we need, we commend to your infinite mercy, trusting that you hear us 
for the sake of Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, normally in our worship service, we would take up our offering. Obviously, we can't do that right now, but I do want to just take a moment and say thank you all to you who have continued to share your offerings uh, either through our Tithely app or by sending your checks in or bringing uh, your offering in. Uh, again, uh, what a blessing you are to continue to support the ministry of Emmanuel at this difficult time. Thank you and God bless you. And now we pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. That concludes our worship service for today. Have a very blessed week in the Lord. And Lord, hasten the day when we can come back together. <laughs>